called with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. I was able, when we made our TV program this week, I was able to take some of the same truths that I'm trying to communicate to you here concerning these verses and uh, put it over the airwaves. I did it in in a lot less uh, uh, length. I was able to, in one, in the last me- in the last uh, half hour time, to go through all seven unities at one time. You and I, we are looking at it a little bit more closely uh, than than that, and it's really hard for me to pace myself because the information that's in verse three has really, for a long time, been effective in my mind. But even more so now, it, the importance of it uh, just seems to be ringing in my ears. When it says in verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, that if we're going to walk worthy, as it says in verse 1, there's a certain mentality to do it in, that's in verse 2, but verse 3 is where our efforts ought to be centralized and uh, centralized. And, and in those efforts uh, there, we are to keep the unity. And that is to really look at it and study it and ponder it, know exactly what it is. And then protect it, guard it from those who are breaking it, from those who would intrude upon it, from those who would try to add something to it or to take it away. And uh, you and I ought to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then so that we know what unities we're keeping, verses 4 through 6 give us seven divine unities that God has created, not one that we create. And we've already spent the time to talk about the first one, the one body. I don't want to go any further into that, but I do have an article here, uh, and it's amazing how the Lord, when you start learning things, just it just never ends. You just there's more and more to learn. Uh, this is something we talked about. In fact, Dave Stahl brought to our attention on a Wednesday. I'll probably say more about this on Wednesday night again, but it's about a evangelical alliance that's going on uh, concerning men trying to create the unity of the spirit, and what they're doing is they're trying to find just a couple things that we might find agreement on faith in Christ and that Christ is uh, the Son of God and then say okay now now we can all forget about differences and and just all to get together over those truths and Chuck Colson and Pat Robinson are uh, the heads of this thing and and trying to unite everybody who names the name of Christ and really the uniting is for the sake of fighting pornography for fighting abortion for fighting other things and our unity isn't to fight abortion to fight the pornography to to make sure there's prayer in school, to create Christian values in our government and and, and in our society. Uh, That's not the purpose of the local church, the body of Christ. And for them to forget all the doctrine that God has given to us, forget about the fact that God has given us a cross of the Lord Jesus Christ to save us, to take that cross and the message of the cross and discard it and just talk about the Son and faith in the Son as being everything is, is too precious to give up for for unity. God has created a unity through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, and, and men, in creating their unity, are really overdoing what God is doing. They're covering up. In in order to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, you look at something like that and you know it's wrong. And you shouldn't be a part of it. You shouldn't be signing their their petition that's going around or even thinking what, what they're thinking in their minds. We talked last time as well, and I hope, hopefully when I talk about the one body and I mentioned about how the church, so to speak, when you look at it, the visual church is broken up in denominations, which means that they are taking and, and dividing the unity that God has created. There's one church today, it's called the body of Christ. But you know, in saying that, I, I worry about two things in your mind, that you would think that we're the only true church, we're the body of Christ here because we don't have a denominational name. Well, don't ever think that. Uh, What we did try to establish, and perhaps the best way to say it, is that the body of Christ is made up of all believers in the gospel of the grace of God from the calling and commissioning of the Apostle Paul until the rapture of the church. Now, you can belong to, to the Lions Club and be part of the body of Christ. You can belong to all kinds of other things, So just because you belong to a a man's organization doesn't mean that you're not part of the body of Christ. But anyone who hasn't believed the gospel, the grace of God, they're not part of the body of Christ. So that's the way you ought to think about it. And we're not the body of Christ, just the whole body. 
We're just a little local part that meet together and, and realize in Scripture that we need to have a one-mindedness, and we'll get to that part in just a minute. But I don't want you to think that if someone belongs to a denomination that that means they're a heretic. That's not true. Uh, you've always learned from people that have been born to denominations, so, so watch how you think. I, I don't know how, what I'm communicating, so I'm worried about what you're thinking. Uh, but, you know, another thing that I told you, you learn like mad when you study something, is I got another article in the mail this week, in fact, two I'll tell you about. One of them that says, if you put the name church at the end of your denomination, you are breaking the unity of the Spirit. Now, I can point the finger everywhere else, but we call this Grace Bible Church. And this article condemns us for adding the word church to the end of our name. So it's room for thought. Give it some thought that, uh, that we are a local church. And what else do you call a local church but a church? Uh, but anyhow, I don't want to defend myself too much here. It's just interesting. You point the finger, you get it back too, don't you? Uh, the other thing is, as I mentioned to you how some people break up the, the unity of the body by talking about a Jewish believer. And I talked about how I get these articles from Jews to Jesus, uh, Jew, Jews for Jesus. And as if they're different than the rest of us Gentiles for Jesus, you know. Uh, and I said that they break the unity. You know, they sent an, uh, a letter again this week, and, and there was an article. And you know what the article is about? That the Jews ought to be attending Gentile churches because we're one body in Christ. <laughs> and so here I, I criticize them for their name because they seem to separate out the Jews as different believers, but they're teaching the truth of the one body, which was quite interesting, especially at the time I just used it last week and got the letter this week. Uh, so anyhow, it, it's, I want you to think properly concerning the one body. But there's seven unities. Don't add, don't take from to any of them. So the first one was the one body, and the second one that we want to go into today is called and one spirit. And you'll notice in your Bible a capital S. Now we'll talk a little bit about capital S's and small s's uh, just to, on the side, but uh, it is important that here when you talk about a one spirit that we realize that we're talking about the Holy Spirit, that there is one common spirit in the body of Christ today, and it's the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit, we're, we, could, we could take a study and show the deity of the Holy Spirit. We, when we see the Spirit here, you see in verse 5, Lord, and you see in verse uh, uh, 6, one God and Father. So you got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, actually the Spirit, Son, and Father, in, in these unities here. Uh, and we could talk about that the Holy Spirit is a person, and he is the third person of the Trinity. He is God himself. I mean, I, I don't know how people can take the, the Holy Spirit and depersonalize him into an energy force, but some do. But when you read the Bible, he's always a he. An energy force isn't a he. When I turn on my lights at home, I don't turn on he lights. <laughs> Those are lights. It's an it. It's just electricity running through the air. The Holy Spirit is a person, and, and, he's, and he's related to God the Father, God the Son, and he's always called the Spirit of the Lord. How could the Spirit of the Lord be anything other than Lord himself, God himself? And the Holy Spirit, I won't take the time to show the verses, but the Bible always refers to the Holy Spirit as God. But, it, but it's God in spirit and God in his spirit now uh, living in the believer. Uh, and and just, to, just to say some of the things about what the Holy Spirit does. The one spirit is the one who regenerates all believers. Remember Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That implies we who have trusted the gospel of Christ were dead, but we're no longer dead. We have been quickened, made alive, and it's by the Spirit of God that we've been made alive. And that's the, the subject of regeneration, made new, made alive again in Christ. And, and, uh, and it's by the Spirit. By one Spirit we're regenerated. He regenerates all the believers. Uh, according to one chapter 1, verse 13, he seals us, he sanctifies us, he indwells us, he baptizes us, as we saw a little bit last week and we'll see again in a couple weeks. He teaches us, as we're going to see again today, and he leads us, and, uh, and his, his desire is to fill us. And it's God's Holy Spirit that wants to do that in each one of us and has done some of it and desires to do other things in our life. Uh, First of all, come back with me to 1 Corinthians. Now, make sure you hold your place in Ephesians. But let's go back to that 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want you to just see some verses here concerning the one spirit that we share together. You know, just a verse that takes some thought. It says in verse 13, it says, For by one spirit, and that's the one spirit we're studying in Ephesians, isn't it? 
By one spirit are we all, that's the one body, isn't it? Are we all baptized into one body? That baptism is the one baptism. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. Now notice the last part. And have been all made to drink into one spirit. Now, sometimes I look at that and I think, are we drinking in the Spirit? Because I know the Bible says that, the, that all believers are indwelt by the Spirit of God. But it's saying that we all have been made to drink into one Spirit. It's as if the Holy Spirit is drinking us in, isn't it? And then you begin to realize in your Bible there's two great important truths. You can read in Romans chapter 8 that you are in the Spirit and not in the flesh. Then also you can read in this verse and get the idea that, yeah, if we're made to drink into one spirit, here's the one body of Christ, and the one body of Christ is in the Spirit of God. Yet, you could go back, just go back a few chapters here to chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. And Paul says in verse 19, he says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Uh, you are indwelt, verse 20, but you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. We belong to the Lord now. But that verse tells us that the Holy Ghost is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. We who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, all of us in the one body have the same indwelling Holy Spirit. But at the same time, all of us collectively are in the Spirit. You know, you have that, the whole body of Christ, is in Christ. And yet you can go to Romans chapter 8 and find out that Christ is in you. You can find out in Ephesians, if you're holding your place in Ephesians, look at back in Ephesians and look at these two verses. Chapter 2, verse 21. It says, In whom all the building fitly framed together unto a holy temple, where? In the Lord. In whom, in the Lord, ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So God, not only are we in the Lord, a holy temple in the Lord, that we're, we're in Him, but then God indwells us, we're a habitation of God through the Spirit. He's in us. So there's a, as you read through Scripture, you begin to talk about the, the unity that we have. We're one in the Spirit, and at the same time, we all, being different members of the body of Christ, are also indwelt independently, separately, with the very same Spirit. So, you know, we, we come over here and we begin to study about the one body. But there's a great unity that this body has. Not only are we all placed in Christ, we have a spiritual unity that the Holy Spirit is involved with as we're all in the Spirit, and that the same Holy Spirit indwells us. If you have the same spirit, there's something in common there, isn't there? And you and I, as members of the body of Christ, we share a common spirit together. Yeah. Go back with me as well now to 1 Corinthians, and look at chapter 1. And let me show you something that the Holy Spirit is desiring. Now, we could talk about all that the Spirit desires to do, but I've just selected some things out that I want you to understand, and that would un help you understand how you can keep the unity of the Spirit. There's only one Spirit. And all who believe are in that spirit, and that spirit is in those believers. Now, Paul says in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, in verse 10, chapter 2, verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. That is, the hidden things of God are now revealed by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might, what? Know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual the Holy Ghost is given to us that we might know the things that God has freely given to us. And we could never know those things because we would know the spirit of man because our, we, having a common spirit, we understand things about each other. Having the common spirit of God, we know some things about God because we have his spirit. 
And that Holy Spirit is given to us that we might know those things that are given to us of God. And how do we know them? Well, according to verse 13, Paul says, which things we speak. Paul speaking is the word of God, which now the Holy Spirit in the believer can take the words of God and apply them to the believer's life. Now, Paul don't come here and speak. But Paul wrote this epistle. Paul wrote the epistle of Ephesians. He wrote Romans to Philemon. And when you read the books of Romans to Philemon, what you have is what God the Holy Spirit wrote and recorded for you to know. He wants you to know it. And His Spirit is in you to help you learn these things. And that's why it says in verse 13, which things we also speak, in, not in words with man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. That is, words which the Holy Ghost teaches. God the Holy Ghost gave us some words that we can read and it teaches us concerning the things of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You know, if we have one common spirit, that common, that Holy Spirit has got some truths that he wants each of us to know and that Holy Spirit is teaching us. Now, he's not teaching us apart from what's written down in the Bible. The Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Peter told us, Holy Moon of God moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit gave us this Bible. He gave us the words. Now he's inside of our spirit as well so that he can take the words, the spiritual words, and teach them to our spirit itself and, and, and guide our life and lead our life according to God's word. Now, the Holy Spirit didn't say anything to you that he didn't say to me. And the Holy Spirit's not doing anything different in me that he's doing in you. We talk about having one body, but we also have one spirit. And you know what we're starting to get from that one spirit? A one-mindedness. Of everything that God wants us to know, everything that God wants us to be, everything that God wants us to do. It's all written right here. And as we'll turn to the scripture and learn what the Holy Spirit has for us here, we're going to come up to the same conclusion. You know, when you get to, to areas, and later on we'll talk about the one faith, but when you get into, into the areas where people are believing something different uh, from one another, it's not because the Holy Spirit said something to them that he didn't say to us. It's either they're not believing what the Holy Spirit said, or they're trying to steal some part of the Bible that the Holy Spirit didn't speak to them and tell them this is what God wants you to do in the age of grace, or we're doing that. There's a mistake somewhere is what I want you to understand. There is only one truth that God has given us, and he's given us one spirit to teach us what those truths are, to illuminate us to the word of God. Now, I said I'm going to say something about big, big S and small s. You hold your place here in, in 1 Corinthians, but look again back in Ephesians, where I knew you held your place. First, uh, no, Ephesians chapter 1. And remember what Paul prayed for us in verses 17 and 18 of chapter 1 of Ephesians that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, that's a small s, isn't it? So that can't be the Holy Spirit, and I'm glad it can't be because that means God didn't give me the Holy Spirit. We, we talked about the wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge of him. This is Paul who wrote it down. We have the revelation. But we've got to get the revelation out of the pages of this Bible and into our life, don't we? We have to have the Word of God living in us. So Paul's praying that God would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. How? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You know what? When you take your eyes and you start studying what the Holy Spirit with the big S wrote, that Holy Spirit begins to teach the little s, the spirit in you, the Word of God. And you become, you, you start understanding what God wants, what God expects out of you. If you do it collectively, we all start moving the same direction, don't we? And it's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work in each of us, teaching us and illuminating us to the truths that God would have us to know. And so you see that God's Spirit is working in your spirit, teaching through His Word. And He uses, I mean, there's all kinds of ways the Holy Spirit uses. The, the whole Holy Spirit, you're in Ephesians, let's get it now, we'll come back to chapter 4, and look at verse 15. It says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Can you imagine growing up into Christ? <laughs> that's, that's like grow up to be like Christ, isn't it? That's what that verse is talking about. It's, the into is not the wrong word. That's the right word. We're, we're to grow up into Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted 
by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying how? Of itself in love. You know, here we are, we're all one body, and we all have been given the very same spirit so that when we learn the things of God's word, we can edify each other so that ju not just one person grows up, but we all grow up. But how do we all grow up? Well, it's not just the Holy Spirit teaching you independently, individually on yourself, on your own. But it's the Holy Spirit in you and the Holy Spirit in me and the Holy Spirit collectively where we're teaching each other and saying that's right, that's wrong. No, you're not quite saying it right. Something wrong here. We don't quite understand this verse. And working on it together and then the whole body of Christ grows up. How? Speaking the truth in love. You don't grow with error. You grow with truth. And so the Holy Spirit working in us and in us communicating in the body of Christ, we begin to grow. Now, I have to warn you, uh, come over with me to, well, you're here in Ephesians, come over first to Philippians. One, one of the things that I see what the Holy Spirit does is creates this. You see, uh, Philippians chapter 1. I quote this so often you probably have it memorized. It says in verse 27, and, and if the Holy Spirit is in our mind, or in our heart first, and then communicating with our mind the truths of God's Word, we'll all be knowing what God wants for us, how He wants us to live, what He wants us to be doing, right? We'll, we'll just all come to that knowledge. Well, if we do, then, then this is how this prayer of Paul for us can be accomplished. It says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Well, the Holy Spirit, you know how the Holy Spirit wants to use your tongue, doesn't he? Now, the conversation is more than just tongue. It has to do with your whole life, but both go together. You use your tongue as well as your life, and, you, and you only have, your life is for one purpose. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in what? One spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know exactly that the Holy Spirit uses us all in different ways, but it's like one giant funnel just funneling down for the same ultimate purpose, and that is for you and I to live, to know the gospel, to live the gospel, and to preach the gospel. And, and the conversation has to do with your manner of life. It's not just what you say, but it's how you live. The gospel has a plan for us to live, but the Holy Spirit is, is funneling it all down for one purpose, so that we with one spirit, uh, our spirit in tune with God's spirit, that's our spirit in tune with his, may be one-minded, and what will we be doing? Striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, when I think about the one body, and then the next statement is one spirit. You know, when God was creating a nation, you know what you need in a nation for a nation to, to properly work? You need a king, because the king is the head of the nation. But the king works through laws, and he dictates his laws to the, to the uh, uh, what do you call the people in the kingdom? Subjects, subjects thank you. <laughs> to the subjects of the kingdom. I have it in my notes, but I didn't want to search for it. <laughs> you've got subjects in the kingdom, and the way a kingdom can operate properly is you've got a king, and he puts out his decrees, his laws. Those subjects live faithfully under those laws, and they're giving assignments of ruling with him, so that there can be a, a control over the nation. God was creating a nation, and that's what his purpose for the nation of Israel is and will be fulfilled in the future. Today we've learned that God is not creating a nation, he's creating a body. Now, a body needs a head, doesn't it? And we know the head of the body is the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? If you've got a body and you've got a head, you've got to have a central nervous system that's going to take the data from that head and communicate it down to the body to every different member. My finger is going to get a response. If I want to eat something and I've got to pick up a piece of chicken to eat it, my brain's got to communicate. My mouth wants to eat. My stomach's saying I'm hungry. But my hand's got to reach out and grab that chicken. And my teeth's got to go to work. And all the rest of the system's got to work. And, and they're all different parts of the body. But there's one thing in common. There's a central nervous system taking all those different parts, working it together for one common purpose, the good of this body. And the head's controlling that. The head is the Lord Jesus Christ of a body, but you know who the central nervous system is to the body? It's the Holy Spirit. We have one common spirit who's got one common purpose to do what the head has asked it to do, 
and the Holy Spirit has given us written word and communicated it to us through writing and through our spirit to know the things that God would have us to do so that it's not a body that's acting dysfunctionally, but a body that's doing exactly what the head wants it to do. The Holy Spirit is what gives us the one-mindedness. Now, when I said I started to warn you, come over with me to our scripture reading, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Oh, I'm in first. Uh, Paul warns us something that he worried about. And, and here's where you also will see the little less showing up. It says, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye may, uh, you might well bear with him. Paul feared that Satan would take the believers and divide them and, and lead them astray by someone coming along and preaching, but when they preach, they'll preach another Jesus. Jesus means Savior. It could be a whole different Savior other than Jesus Christ, or it might be Jesus Christ saving a different way than the Bible says he saved. He saved. He might, they might preach Jesus Christ as the king rather than Jesus Christ as the head of the body. Paul was afraid, afraid that someone's going to come in and preach Jesus Christ to them in another way that's going to get them off the track. He says if they preach that, you might bear with them. There's, there's, there's something wrong that you haven't studied and discerned to the point that when someone's saying something wrong, you can't see that it's wrong and you might go their way and, and, and Satan divide the body or it shouldn't be divided. He says, not only is he afraid that someone will preach another Jesus, he says, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received. Now, I know the one we received is the spirit which is of God. We already learned that. When we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were received God's Holy Spirit and were sealed by God's Holy Spirit. But Paul's now worried that they'll receive a spirit which ye have not received. That's a little less. Now, I don't think he's worried about them being demon-possessed. But we know in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul says that the Spirit speaketh expressly, that's the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly that in the last days men shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You know, when you see that another spirit there, you know what that is? If the Holy Spirit is teaching me the truth of God's word, another spirit is a false doctrine. Someone who came and preached not just another Jesus, but another doctrine of how God is working today, what God wants accomplished today, that the Corinthians might bear with them. And that doctrine comes in the form, it's called a, another spirit, and another spirit is a false doctrine. And Paul says, if someone comes along preaching a false doctrine, I'm worried that you, you'd follow them. And, and it's because they didn't have spiritual discernment to know, wait a minute, that's not what God the Holy Spirit said in the Word of God. And if they're not eyes or not in tune with the Word of God and haven't learned from, in the Bible from the Spirit the Word of God, someone comes along just saying something else, they just follow them. That's called being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And Paul worried that the Corinthians would follow another spirit. And you know what another spirit is? Larry tell me uh, about a man that he worked with who the Spirit told him that when Billy Graham dies, it's the end of the age of grace. And that's, that's when the age of grace is going to come. You know, I study this Bible from cover to cover. I've never read Billy Graham's name in this thing. Somehow this guy has a spirit that's telling him when Billy Graham dies, it's the end of the, of the age of grace. You know what that is? That's another spirit. That, did, that spirit didn't write this Bible. I can check that. That's another spirit. That's another doctrine. True or false, it's not God's word. It's, it's a man making something up in his own mind. I know what the Spirit said. I have the Word of God here. He wrote this so that I might be not only receive doctrine, but instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This is a perfect word. I don't need anything else outside of this. And so when someone says something like that, you mark it down yourself. That's another spirit. It's not the spirit that wrote this book. And don't bear with them. Then the other, he says, another gospel. And that's someone preaching something other than the gospel of the grace of God. Nothing else can save. Because we're told in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, that it's either by grace or, or it's by works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And if it's by works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. It's one or the other. It's grace or works. 
And the other gospel is anything other than the salvation by God's grace through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ to save. So Paul warns us of this. Well, you know, uh, really running low on time. Let me, let me tell you, maybe you just want to write down these things. Write down to you uh, in, in writing uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19. I hardly have to have you turn there because among the list of little, little statements Paul makes as he closed 1 Thessalonians, he says something that I think you need to keep in mind. It says, quench not the Spirit. We've been given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us the Word of God. We know from the Bible that we are to walk after the Spirit. And, and that is that after you learn what the Holy Spirit says, go that direction. That is called the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit don't lead you through a vision and through a dream. The Holy Spirit tells you what God would have you to do. If you do that, you're walking after the Spirit. And why are you going that direction? You're being led of the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit teaches us God's Word, and by that we walk after the Spirit. We're led of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians 5.18, wants to control us, and that's what the word filled means when it says, don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is active, working in us, but 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, quench not the Spirit. Now, I, I want you to realize that there's two negative statements about the Holy Spirit given in the Bible. And I want you to realize that here the Holy Spirit, the one Spirit, is operating in us, giving us one-mindedness so that we'll do what? Strive together for the faith of the gospel. Get the gospel out by our life and by our words and all that we do. Live for Christ. And as the Holy Spirit's doing that, you can quench the Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean get rid of the Spirit, but the Holy Spirit, you know, it tells us in, in what is it, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 11, that we're to be fervent in spirit. You know what fervent means? On fire. It means to be hot, like a fever. It means to be hot. You know, if you've got the Holy Spirit leading you and you're walking after the Spirit and you're doing the things that God wants done today in the age of grace, you're following that, you know what can happen? Someone could put water on it and quench it. Put the fire out. And the Bible says, quench not the Spirit. You have to be careful in your life as the Holy Spirit is leading you that you're not hindering the leading. For instance, if the Holy Spirit is working in your life, teaching you some things, and you won't follow that leading, you know what you're doing in your life? You're quenching the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit's going to lead, teach you so far, and as you follow, then He's going to teach you a little further. There's some leading going on here, but at a certain point in your life, you won't follow, whether it's in doctrine or in practice, you quench the Holy Spirit. There's no more fire, no more zeal. The Holy Spirit can't lead you on beyond that. You're, you're hindering it. And, and God wants you to be fervent in spirit, growing and, and doing the things that God would have you to do. The other is in Ephesians, and so you're there. So look at Ephesians chapter 4 with me. The other negative, that is. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Uh, it's interesting how Paul just puts that together. Don't grieve him, but at the same time he re reaccounts the promise that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. He's with you until the day God's going to take you home to glory. That's the guarantee that you're saved. We learned that in chapter 1 of Ephesians. That's the guarantee that we're saved, but the Holy Spirit, just the fact that he won't leave, doesn't mean he can't be grieved. And the Bible says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. In the context here, look at verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Now, you know, if you let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, are you being led of the Holy Spirit to do that? No. If you refuse to obey it, you'll be quenching the Spirit, won't you? But when you quench the Spirit, you're also doing something else. You're grieving Him. He's a person, folks. He's God who's working in your life. And when you, you don't follow His leading and you refuse His, His promptings, what you are is not only quenching the Spirit, but you're grieving the Spirit of God. And he'll, leave, he'll not leave you nor forsake you. He's with you to the end, but he, you're grieving him. Verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know, the Holy Spirit does bring unity, doesn't it? By getting rid of all the negative things that divide us and get us one-mindedness together, and then working together for the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're in one body, in one spirit. 
Can I share with you, and I dare do this, but I'd like to do it. Ephesians 4, 4 has one more call, uh, one more oneness in there. It says, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. Now notice that, called and one hope of your calling. It, you got called, that's past tense. Calling is, the pre, is a present tense of, of something else. You're waiting for something. The one hope of your calling is we've been called into salvation. We got saved, that's past. But now we're in a calling. We're in a service of God that goes on now waiting for something great event to take place. That great event is called one hope. And you and I as believers, we have one hope of our calling. Uh, this is a blessed hope as it's called in Titus. It says, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our one hope is, the, is when Jesus Christ is going to come for us and call us unto himself and we're ever going to be with him. When, when he does that, what we're talking about is the time of resurrection. We as a body, are see, we're, here's one body and one spirit and we're sealed by that spirit until when? The day of redemption. You know what the one hope of our calling is? The day we're going to be redeemed off of this earth and to be present with the Lord. And at that point, he's going to raise our body and we're going to be glorified and we're going to live with the Lord forever. And so we have one hope in the body. And I'm just going to share just a statement with you and then we're going to pick it up next week because I don't, it, the one hope's too great for me to just rush it through in a minute. But, but the, the thought is, you know, a lot of people are offering all their hopes to get your eyes on other things. We have one hope of our calling. And it's the day that God is going to halt, call us home to glory. If you're hoping for something else, you're, fall, you're falling short of the one hope that we have. You're going to find, and, and I'll show you the verses next week, that the, the world today is taking a Christian and making them hope that they get rich, that this is God's will for you, you can be rich. And then you, you know, with that wealth, you can also have prosperity. And God's just going to bless everything you do, not just the money that you make. He just bless everything you do. Your car will never break down, never need tires, all the rest. And then he'll make you healthy. You'll never get sick. And if you get sick, he'll heal you. You know, your hope isn't, isn't in being healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's not your hope. You have one hope, is that there's going to be a calling, that God is going to call the believers out of this earth, and we're going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we ever be with the Lord. At that point, the Bible says, this corruption will put on incorruption. This mortality will put on immortality. Until that time, it's going to suffer corruption. Until that time, we face physical death. But when that time comes, it's all in the past, and we're with the Lord forever. We'll talk about that next week, about our one hope, and, and realize how glorious it's going to be. But I want you to keep your eyes always fixed on the fact that God has given you one hope, and you keep looking for the Lord and waiting for him to come, that he could come at any time. Now with that, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? Are you part of the one body of Christ? Do you have the one Spirit? Because if you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't, you're none of his. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit himself, as it says in Ephesians 1.13, after you trust the gospel of your salvation, after you put your faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as the complete payment of sin, God's Son who loved you and died for you and rose again, and if you trust the work that he did for you at Calvary, that God loved you, Christ died for you, God says you are saved. And, and then being saved, you, you share all the onenesses of Ephesians 4 together with us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time together. And Father, we thank you that these are precious truths. And, and I do thank you as well for wisdom to stop rather than to, 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 to take something great and wonderful and, and try to go too fast. Father, may we grow together. May it be a, something that touches our lives. May we know how to look into the world and, and, and realize that there's many people claiming to know Christ, but only those who know the gospel of the grace do indeed know Christ. We're at different levels and, and uh, different understandings that your Holy Spirit would teach us to teach one another so that we could grow together. And we pray, Lord, that we'll honor you by guarding very closely the unities you've given us and just find them fulfilling in our life. 